I'm going to tell you a story about how really one man founded an intellectual movement that is today thriving. Uh, and, and that man, as, as we'll see, was Carl Menger. Okay, Carl Menger initially started off as a journalist, and he would cover the financial markets and the commodities markets. And up to that point, as we'll see in a moment, the prevailing theory of price was that costs of production, the amount of money it costs, or in, in, in some parts of Great Britain, uh, the amount of labor it took to produce a good, determined the price. Well, Menger is sitting there looking at the markets, because he has to report on them, and he sees that prices are changing, not only every day, for coal and cloth and so on, they're fluctuating every second. So Menger thinks, well, this, this can't be due to cost of production. They're not changing uh, you know, with such volatility and with, 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 with such rapidity. Uh, there has to be another explanation. Menger goes on to get his, his PhD uh, and writes a book, or actually writes a, a thesis, which then became a book, um, and it's a, a small book. It's called The Principles of Economics. Now, this is, it's not actually this small. The Mises Institute has a, an interesting way of, of, of making very readable pocketbooks. So it's actually a little bit bigger than this. Um, the print tends to be small in this. So it's about 300 pages, a little bit more. And it was really only supposed to be an introduction to a full treatise of econ on economics that was going to be three volumes. But um, Menger got sidetracked. So, uh, but this book itself, Principles of Economics, was the book that then went on to revolutionize economics. Now, this revolution occurred during what was called the marginalist revolution, and sometimes it's confused, what Menger's contribution was, uh, is confused with the contributions of two other great economists uh, who were not as great as Menger and who ha had a, a number of fallacies in their version of, of, of this revolution. Um, it was called the marginalist revolution, and the marginalist revolution really refers to the simultaneous and independent discovery uh, of the principle of marginal utility, which I will explain in a little while, by three different economists. Okay? Um, as I point out here, they were working independently of one another. The books were, were published in 1871. Uh, two of them were published in 1871, and, the, and one was published in 1874. They were published by uh, widely um, disparate individuals, individuals in different locations. Uh, we had Carl Menger in Austria, The Principles of, of, of Economics. William Stanley Jevons was in Great Britain. His book was called The Theory of Political Economy. And finally, Leon Walras, who was um, a French economist who went to Switzerland, um, published Elements of Pure Economics. The latter two were mathematical to a greater or lesser extent. The third one was the, was the most mathematical. Uh, just to give you a sort of graphic representation of these guys, that's while Ross on the left, the guy who looks like a serial killer, is <laughs> William Stanley Jevons. Okay. Um, and this was the founder of the Austrian school. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You'll meet him later. Very interesting gentleman. The founder of the Austrian school was Karl Menger, as I said. And uh, here was Menger. This is why many Austrians have beards, taking after the great founder. Um, but they had three different n uh, names for what was called, uh, what came to be known as marginal utility. Now, Menger never gave a term to to what, he, what came to be known as marginal utility. Um, but his student, Friedrich von Wieser, called it uh, Grenznutzen in German, which is marginal utility. Uh, Jevons called it final utility. And um, Valras called it rarité. Okay? And again, I'll explain what, 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 the, what, what this really was in Menger's uh, view. Um, but let me just say for now that um, for Valras and Jevons, Utility was simply a quantity of satisfaction that individuals passively received 
from goods. So in, in drinking this bottle of water, I am piling up a certain amount of, util of utility, which can be added up according to them and, and can be compared between people. The people who have water in the front row, uh, they may only be getting 10 utils from their bottle, I'm getting 20. Um, he may be only getting three utils, of course, but what, 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 what the heck is a util? Okay, I mean, there, there's no unit of measurement for satisfaction. Menger understood that, and therefore for Menger, utility was something active. It was the result of a judgment of the importance of different goods to a human being's well-being, okay, or in satisfying a human being's wants, okay. So Menger put the individual's judgment about his well-being and his wants at the center of economic activity. Um, Menger was a creative genius. Okay, he had many influences, both from the British economists and, and from uh, the German tradition that he came out of. And some of them talked about subjective uh, value, okay. though they didn't develop this concept of marginal utility, which is the key to explaining prices. What Menger really wanted to do, as we'll see in a moment, is to explain prices using one principle, okay, which, which the classical school, which we'll talk about, was unable to do. Um, his unique way at, of looking at the economy as a result of individuals striving to satisfy their wants gave us a unifying principle um, for the entire economy. That is, a principle that explained all economic phenomena, from the pricing of a simple bottle of water to the pricing of a very complicated input into, let's say, a, a, a tablet computer. Okay? He, his system explained everything. Okay? He himself didn't draw out all the implications. His students later did, and of course, von Mises and and Rothbard really, in a sense, completed the entire system. But the seeds were there. Let me just show you some quotes from very famous historians of economic thought about Menger. Joseph Schumpeter, who was, bo was born in Austrian but was not a follower of the Austrian school, was not a follower of Menger, yet he said, Menger is nobody's pupil and what he created stands. Menger's theory of value, price, and distribution is the best we have up to now. That was in the mid-1920s, after Alfred Marshall had written, after many other economists had written. Um, Ludwig von Mises says, or said, um, what is known as the Austrian School of Economics started in 1871 when Karl Menger published the slender book that we talked about. Until the end of the 70s, there was no Austrian school. There was only Karl Menger. And finally, Hayek, who was Mises' student, um, said, the Austrian school's fundamental ideas belong fully and wholly to Karl Menger. What is common to the members of the Austrian school, what, counts, what constitutes their peculiarity, in a good sense, of course, and provided the foundations for their later contributions, is their acceptance of the teaching of Karl Menger. And I think that's still true today. Okay. Now, who were the classical economists? Because it was the classical school of economics to which Menger was reacting. Okay. He didn't want to, some people think that he wanted to completely overthrow the classical school. That's not true. They had some interesting insights, important insights, that he wanted to um, encompass in, in a greater unifying principle that explained everything. They, they did not, as we'll see. So the classical school was composed of basically three economists. Um, David Hume, famous Scottish philosopher and uh, historian and, and, and a writer on economics. Adam Smith and his famous Wealth of Nations. Smith is wrongly characterized very frequently as a, as a founder of economics. Well, certainly, as in, he wasn't really a, a, a big figure in the founding of Austrian economics by any means. There were there people that lived hundreds of years before Smith that contributed more to Austrian economics. And then David Ricardo, uh, uh, and who, who lived in 1811, uh, who wrote his, his great, his uh, very short treatise in 1811, um, was the third. Okay, the problem with the main problem with the classical school was their theory of value. Okay, and um, their theory of value presented a paradox. Okay, they were the ones that said that it's really um, costs of production that determines prices, um, at least in the long run. And they came up against something called the paradox of value. 
Okay, sometimes called the diamond water paradox. The paradox is simply, why is it the case that something like diamonds, which have a very high objective exchange value, that is a price on the market, um, have such a low use value? Okay, they're, um, you know, they're used for or bodily ornamentation, um, to, to uh, show off one's wealth as conspicuous consumption and so on. Um, if, if, a, if diamonds were all to disappear from the world, uh, humankind wouldn't be that much worse off. On the other hand, water has a relatively low exchange value, relatively low price on the market, but yet it has an extremely high use value. If water were to disappear from the world, we would all disappear about three or four days later. Okay? So water has a very high use value, and yet, paradoxically, it has a low um, market value. So what, was the solution, what, what solution did the classical economists come up with? They basically said, well, economics is not concerned um, with explaining use value. Okay, yes, yes, for a good to have any value, it has to be useful to human beings, but we're not interested in, in explaining different degrees of use value. Uh, what's really important is that economists explain um, what determines price, that is, exchange value. Um, th therefore, their solution was diamonds are much more expensive than water because it costs more money to produce, let's say, a given weight of diamonds let's, uh, uh, when com uh, compared to the same weight of water. So a gallon of water, which weighs about eight pounds, is much less to produce, or costs much less to produce, in either money or labor, okay, um, than, do, than do diamonds, okay, of the same weight, let's say eight pounds of, of gem quality diamonds. And of course, that was wrong, okay. Uh, and Menger saw that that was wrong after he had this, this, this insight um, on, by uh, looking at markets in the real world. So let's just say, uh, talk a little bit more about the classical school. Um, uh, but by the way, let me, I have an interesting picture here just to show you that that has to be. That diamond uh, is called a graph pink. It sold for $46 million at auction a few years ago. Certainly didn't cost $46 million to produce. Um, there's an even better picture of it. Okay, see how big it is? I think uh, Kobe Bryant gave a purple diamond to his wife that was worth $10 million after uh, she caught him in, a, in an act of infidelity. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about more, more about exchanges uh, in a little while, and Men Menger's attitude toward exchange. Uh, in any case, classical school said some good things. First of all, they, they, they did say that, look, prices aren't random, okay? They are determinate. Okay? They're caused by other things. In the short run, they did say that they were caused by supply and demand, in the long run, by cost of production. Okay? So in other words, they're not arbitrarily set by businesses. They're not accidents of history. Okay? They are determinate. The other thing that the classical school pointed out was that they, they regulate production. Okay? They allow businesses to calculate prices. They use cost, uh, co uh, prices of, of the factors of production of resources compare them to, to prices that they can get on the market for the product, and that allows them to calculate uh, uh, profits and losses. So they did have a theory of calculation which was, was pretty sophisticated. And, and here was the, here's a sort of slide showing that, how, how um, prices regulate production according to the classical school. Okay, so if, if the demand for oil shoots up, Price of oil shoots up above the average cost, uh, and that causes high profits, okay, which are in classical school above the normal profits. There was always some normal profit they talked about. The Austrians later on cleared that up too, okay, what was a normal profit. Um, and as a result, you got a, a huge increase in, in, in supply. Now, today, when, when, in the last few years, we've had a tremendous amount of fracking, that is, um, uh, producing a substitute for the high-priced oil, so that the, the um, supply of fuels are, are, is shifting to the right. Okay? And once that happens, then you'll find the price will return towards the natural or long-run price. 
So the classical school always thought that prices were tending towards the long run price, which was the price that equaled the cost of production. But at least they showed the dynamics of how changes in supply resulted from changes in demand. Or for example, um, when the iPad was released in, in um, 2010, and there were tremendous profits, okay, within a few years we've had the um, various different kinds of tablet computers with Android systems and so on, Google, Microsoft. So the supply has increased of tablet computers, okay? And prices have begun to come down of tablet computers. Okay? The classical school is right about how prices regulated production. They just had an incorrect theory of how prices themselves were determined. So um, the classical theory did involve a theory of calculation. Businesses, businessmen, okay, and for the most part they were all men then, were considered to be calculators. And this is where the idea of the economic man or the homo economicus came into play. That is, business, the, 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 the classical school focused on the business decision maker and um, basically said that he buys in markets, he buys where, uh, in markets that are cheap, sells in markets that are dear, where the prices are high. And that was correct as far as it went, okay, but it just didn't go far enough for Menger. Also, the, the classical school is right in saying that the law of supply and demand and this, um, these, this dynamics of how prices determine production um, was abstract and universal. It applied to everyone. Okay? Menger liked all of those things about the classical school. Okay? What he didn't like were some of the implications uh, of, of their doctrine. Um, first of all, they attempted to explain prices in terms of classes of goods. So they talked about bread, diamonds, water, coal, iron, cotton, and so on. They talked about it in broad classes. And as we'll see, that's part of the, of the reason for their paradox of value that they were unable to solve. Um, the, uh, the classical economists could not resolve the, the seeming um, paradox. For example, what they did notice, okay, they, they were very insightful and, 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 and brilliant men. What they did notice was land didn't have any cost of production, let, yet in many cases it had a very high price. Uh, paintings by long dead um, artists, they, they didn't have any cost of production, or, 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 or they had very high prices that had no relation to, to what their cost of production were in the past. They couldn't explain that. Okay. Uh, they, they, there, were, there were many things that they, 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 they couldn't explain. Uh, uh, antiques, the price of antiques could not be explained. Okay. So what they did was they made the cardinal error of splitting the uh, theory of value and price into two parts. And they said, well, as a theory of producible goods, most goods are producible, cotton, coal, diamonds, and so on. And in that case, the cost of production theory of value. Um, explain prices. But in the case of non-producible goods, um, supply and demand or, or monopoly, in the case of land, they believe really all landowners were monopolists, pretty much. That explained prices okay, of those types of goods. So this whole idea that of, of being unable to resolve the paradox of value, being unable to show how the use value brought about or played a part in bringing about um, exchange value, made them focus on the businessman. They just forgot about use value, as I said before. The businessman became the central actor in the, uh, in the economic drama. And so we got something called homo economicus. That is that economists simply focused on people who, wanted, who were selfish, who bought at a cheap price and sold at a high price. And that was completely incorrect from Menger's point of view, as we'll see. They also came up with an even um, more ridiculous uh, cost of production theory called the labor theory of value. Um, Ricardo did that. Uh, um, according to the labor theory of value, the price of a good, or, or comparing two prices, or the price of two goods, um, that price ratio reflected the amount of hours that were contained in each good. So for example, if uh, a BMW costs $50,000 and a Toyota Corolla 
costs twenty thousand dollars. Well, then the BMW contained two and a half times the amount of labor as the Corolla, which just looking around in the real world is not true. Okay. And so their 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 theory of um, value was, was sort of uh, a sweat theory of value. In other words, value was infused into the good by the, the labor laborer sweating over it, okay? But let's say the laborer sweat over digging ditches or building a structure that, that no one wanted to buy. Didn't matter how many la hours he, he labored or how much money, if you want to go to the cost of production theory, how much money was spent on building this structure, building a pyramid in the middle of London or something like that, that, that no one wanted, okay? It still would not have value. So all of these things um, were uh, brewing in Menger's mind okay, when he was writing his book. Um, another thing was that, uh, that, uh, that was wrong with the, with the uh, theory of value as presented by the um, classical school was that exchange indicated to them an equality of value. Okay? That is, that if um, a bottle of water exchanged for $1.50, well, then it was equal in value to $1.50. Okay, and if an automobile exchanged for $30,000, then it was equal in value to the $30,000. Okay? Because basically the price was equal to the cost of production, the cost of producing that particular item. Okay, now let's look at what, what Menger had to say about all of this. What Menger wanted to do, as I said before, was to come up with a theory of, of, of value and price that encompassed all economic phenomena. And he says this in a preface to his book. He's, he says, I have devoted special attention to the investigation of the causal connections, he's very big on cause and effect, as we'll see, between economic phenomena involving products and the corresponding agents of production, meaning the resources. Not only for the purpose of establishing a price theory based upon reality, okay, he wanted to, 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 to base it on, 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 on real things, he says, and placing all price phenomena, interest, wages, ground rent, together under one, one unified point of view, meaning he wanted, to, he wanted a principle that explained all prices of all things, not just consumer goods, but of, of capital goods and of land and labor. He says, but also because of the important insights we thereby gain into many other economic processes, heretofore up to this point, completely misunderstood. So his point was that all economic phenomena could be elucidated by a correct theory of price. And when he wrote notes to himself in writing his book, um, he pointed out the basic themes of his work. He said, look, man himself is the beginning and the end of every eco economy. The beginning, because it's his wants that activate, his act that activate um, economic activities, okay, that bring them about and the satisfaction of those wants, which is the end of the economy. Okay? He also said, our science is the theory of a human being's ability to deal with his wants. So here you see, he's putting wants at the center. He's not putting cost of production at the center. He's not putting the business decision maker at the center. And then he says, all things are subject to the law of cause and effect. Okay? Basically, goods had value because they caused the satisfaction of human wants when they were consumed. And those things that caused the production of goods, so if a diamond mine and diamond workers and the gem uh, dealer, all of these people caused the production of the final gem quality diamond, then all of those things have to have value. He also put up in his notes, what we might call a tr tr trinities of causation. So you start with ends. People have ends, that is to satisfy their wants. They need means in their external environment with which to, 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 to produce to satisfy these wants. And then when the means have been transformed into the things necessary to satisfy the ends, you have realization of the ends. Okay. Um, that is also man, you start with man, you have the external world, he works on the external world, and he, he produces his subsistence. Okay. So the beginning is always a subjective, notice. The ends, the, man, the human being, the subject, and the wants. There's wants, goods, satisfaction. The beginning and the end are subjective. 
Okay? The objective comes in the middle. It's, it, it's involved in transforming the elements of our environment, the resources, into the ends. So his, his theory of economics was subjective through and through, though he always um, focused on a, 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 an external reality. Okay? Some Austrians, um, uh, in contem contemporary Austrians, almost lose sight of the middle. The middle is, is the key, okay? because we're not ghosts just floating um, you know, above the earth. We have, we, have, we have physical bodies, we have, we have needs that arise from those physical bodies, and so on, okay? So you do need a cause and effect relationship between the subjective and the objective. And Menger saw that. He was really the first to clearly see that. And that's what, when he came up with a theory of goods. So he brought the objective into it, but within the context of, of subjectivity. Uh, what I want to do is to show you a slide. All right, I, I, I guess I just misplaced that slide, um, but I'll, I have something to show you here. Um, you can see it in the middle here. Um, what was a good to Menger? Okay, what characteristics went into making up a good? Uh, there had to be a human need. Okay. Um, there, that, there had to be such properties as render the thing capable of being brought into causal connection with the satisfaction of this need. There had to be something out there. Okay? You're hungry, so there's bread, there's ham, there's mayonnaise, uh, there's a knife, uh, there's other utensils that you need, there's a place to, 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 to make the ham sandwich, and so on. Okay? Those things um, can be brought into causal connection with satisfying the need okay, once you make the ham sandwich. And then he said, number three, there has to be human knowledge of this causal connection. People have to know about the fact that these things can be transformed into a final consumer's good. And finally, there has to be command of the thing sufficient to direct it to the satisfaction of the need. You have to own it and control it. Okay. Um, now, Mises pointed out, let me keep this up there, that number two and three were actually, there was an error there. Okay. In fact, Mises said, you can combine two and three into one. That is, there has to be a belief that a thing can be brought into causal connection with the end aimed at. Okay? Human beings could be wrong about that. So if you buy diet pills on QVC, okay, they don't bring about the end of, of getting rid of your belly fat, for example. If you, if you seek the services of a psychic, she doesn't really put you or, uh, in, in touch with, 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 with dead relatives or friends. Um, if you read the New York Times, you don't get the truth about the world. <laughs> you watch the, the Rachel Maddow show. I mean, you think you're being entertained, you're really not. Um, so Menger actually, so Menger was so smart that he couldn't let that stand. A few pages later, he says, well, there are imaginary needs. He says, oh, he used women's makeup as an example. And he said, uh, and, and that has, you know, they actually do have a price and a value. So he's admitting what Mises insisted on um, you know, 50 years later, okay? So, so, so Menger, Menger was brilliant, okay? Uh, about the, the last point, about the control um, of, the, of the thing, um, a sunny day serves our needs when we want to go to a baseball game or we want to go, go on a picnic, um, and yet, the sun is not a good, okay? It's not a good because we can't control it, okay? Or let's put it this way, the weather itself is not a good, because at least, up to now, we really can't control the weather. Okay? We can't produce a sunny day. Right? So not all things that, that, that aid in, 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 in the satisfaction of our needs are goods. Okay? Only those things that we can control. And now let me just uh, talk a little bit about um, economic goods. So the first chapter is on goods. Menger is trying to show that goods themselves have subjective components. Okay. And th those are the characteristics that I just specified. But he said now, he went on, he said, not all goods exist in sufficient quantities to satisfy everyone's wants. That's in the second chapter. 
those goods are economic goods, and therefore, they have to be economized. So Menger came up with economizing man, an active individual looking to satisfy his wants, as opposed to economic man, a, 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 a um, businessman that's mechanically reacting to buying cheaply and selling at high prices. Okay? So he displaced economic man with economizing man, okay? an active, uh, uh, someone who's active and creative. So for Menger, here's how you economize. There aren't enough goods to go around. No one has enough resources individually to satisfy all their ends. Therefore, they have to choose which ends to satisfy. But before you can do that, you have to rank which ends are more important, which ends are less important to you. Okay. In other words, unlike Valras and Jevons, who I spoke, spoke of it in the beginning, you don't just sit back and receive these utils from the goods. Okay? You have to actively compare these different things and make a judgment about how important they are to your well-being. So you're active in that sense also, the human being. So as Tom Woods pointed out, um, the Austrian school accords human beings um, the dignity of being human beings, of being active. Okay? It, it doesn't drain them of creativity, make them me mechanical reactors to, to, to you know, uh, prices that are out there. As we'll see, human beings are the ones who determine prices. That is, consumers determine prices. That the entrepreneurs and the businessmen are reacting to. And actually, the entrepreneurs themselves have to be creative because they have to purchase goods with the anticipation that these inputs or resources they're purchasing are going to have, uh, be less expensive than the goods that they produce and sell one month from now, four years from now, five years from now. Menger inserted time and uncertainty into his system, okay? And it's been in Austrian economics ever since. So now let's look at, uh, give an example of, of uh, how we go about economizing. And this is a famous example. <clears throat> Menger gave something like it in his Principles of Economics, von Bavirk, also gave something like it. This is more, I think, von Bavirk's, who's, who, uh, Eugen von, von, von Bavirk was Menger's student and follower, and the one who really completed his price theory. So the example I want to give here is um, the fictional castaway Robinson Crusoe or Tom Hanks or wherever he was, um, has a certain amount of, 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 of wheat on an island. Okay, it's just really his, his labor, and um, the, the, he finds that he can plant uh, maybe some, some uh, um, seeds for, for, for growing wheat are, are, uh, are left on the island along with him when, when, when the boat sinks. So what he wants to do is to decide how he can um, use the wheat so that they satisfy his most important wants. So let's say he ranks the wands as follows. And each one will absorb a full, let's say, sack or bush. Let's say a sack of wheat, because uh, he used sack. Um, so let's say the highest valued end is uh, the bread for sustaining life, OK? One sack of bread will just keep him alive. It won't be too healthy, but it'll just be, it'll be enough to keep him alive for a year, OK? Um, a second sack of bread, if he had it, would uh, be um, enough to, to maintain his vitality and his health so that he can move around and, and, and accomplish other ends. The third would be the seed grain for the following year's harvest. Okay, so he thinks ahead. Um, if he had a fourth sack, um, he would, well, they use whiskey, I like vodka, so he would produce um, a year's supply of vodka. A fifth sack would um, satisfy his fifth most important one. These are ranked in terms of their importance. Notice there's no numbers assigned to this. Menger assigned indexes. He signed 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, but he didn't add and subtract them. Okay? It, but it's better just to assign cardinal numbers, because that, uh, ordinal numbers, because that's what he had in mind. First, second, third, fourth, so on. Um, uh, if he had a sixth sack, he would, he would devote it to food for, uh, for, for company. Let's say he, you know, he's lonely, and there are some parrots, and he can teach them to talk, so he would have a parrot. And maybe he, um, 
once he got to 20 sacks, they would be super abundant. They wouldn't be goods anymore. Okay, they wouldn't be economic goods in his terminology anymore. There would be more than enough to satisfy all his wants. But let's assume that he has five, five, five wants, okay? uh, five sacks. So he, fulf he, he fulfills or satisfies the first five wants. Menger's question was, and, and he, he was very adept at asking um, questions that led to the solution of very important and, and, and troublesome problems that the classical school had. So he said, well, what's the value of a sack of wheat, given that we have these five? Is it the value of the highest ranked end? Is it some average? Is it the value of sort of the average of ends? Well, here's where he asked the question. He said, and he put it in terms of, of a hypothetical example, what if all these sacks were being stored and were going to begin to be used the next day? They were just harvested, they're stored in, in, in a structure he has, and um, you have, let's say, vermin breaking in and, and, and devouring one of the sacks. Let's say they devour sack number two, okay? Um, what, what, what will be the reaction of this creative individual? Will this individual simply say, okay, well, um, I've, I'm devoting these sacks to my first, third, fourth, and fifth ends? No. What he would do is he would give up the expected satisfaction from the lowest ranked end, the fifth end. What he would give up then is the, um, the dairy products and, 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 and meat and so on that could be had from feeding farm animals because that's his lowest rank of, of the five ends that he could, he could um, accomplish. So in that case then, the, the, this, this led to the law of marginal utility and then to the solution of the paradox of value. Utility is simply another word for satisfaction. Marginal simply means last or next. In this case, it means the last. So according to Menger, the value of, of each sack of, of, of wheat, no matter which one it is, if you have five sacks, is the marginal utility. The value of the lowest ranked end that could be satisfied by the existing stock of the good, by the existing supply, by the, by the five sacks. So no matter which sack he lost, he would lose the value he attaches to having meat and dairy products during the year. Okay. And that's the law of marginal utility. And so now then we can, we can, we can specify it. As the, the supply of a good decreases, okay, the marginal utility rises. And therefore, the value of the good rises. So in other words, now if he's left with four sacks, the value of each sack is higher. Because now if he lost one, he'd, ha he'd have to give up his vodka, which is higher ranked than, than, than the dairy and, and meat products. On the other hand, if he fortuitously came across another sack of, of wheat, he could now satisfy a sixth end. The value of that end now uh, is lower. So the margin utility has fallen. Each each um, sack of wheat is valued less because he loses less utility, okay? The margin utility is lower. So the law is as the, the supply of a good increases, the margin utility and the value falls. Um, an example I like to give is if there's a family that has three, three automobiles, and let's say they're pretty much interchangeable. One is for the primary breadwinner, uh, the, uh, that's the highest value use. The second is for, let's say, the, the spouse has a, a, a part-time job and, and uses it to get to and from the part-time job and run errands. And then there's Junior, who has, who has a car to get around. Um, well, what if, what, what if the old man cracks up his car? Well, I mean, he doesn't go without the car. Junior loses the car, because that's the marginal utility of that supply. That's the lowest ranked end keeping Junior off your back from continually asking for the keys and so on. Um, now let, let me make, give you a little more sophisticated example to see if you understand this law. Um, so let's say I have a farmer and he has three horses and two cows. Okay, now these are not interchangeable goods. They have different, they serve different ends. Okay? But still, you, you're still comparing them. You're always comparing goods as to how important they are, whether the same or different, just to your well-being. Um, so let's say there's three horses. So the most important end is, is, is uh, the horse, horse number one plowing the field. Um, second most important end is to have a team of horses plowing the field. It makes farming much easier, more productive. Um, the third is the milk that you could get from the first cow. 
Uh, the, four, the fourth end is, is the milk that you can get, uh, the cheese and butter that you can get to vary his diet. And the fifth is uh, the pleasure riding, uh, the third horse. Okay. Um, which animal is, has a higher value? Okay. Okay. It's, it's the cow. Okay. We, we, we don't look at the first two, high, the highest valued ends. We don't look at them at all. It's, it's the cow that, that has a higher value. And the way to think about this is to ask Menger's question. If the barn's on fire, and you can only say four of the five animals, which animal do you leave in there? You leave a horse in there. Because the margin utility of horses is lower than the margin utility of cows. But once that happens, which animal is more valuable? Now you, have a, now you only have four. Now the horse is more valuable. Because the margin utility of the horse is the satisfaction that you attach to achieving the, the second end. And for the cow, is the satisfaction that you attach for the fourth end. Okay. That's how value is determined. Now we can solve the paradox of value, as Menger did. So Menger pointed out that diamonds, in fact, are more value, valuable than water in a normal situation because diamonds have a higher margin utility. They're scarcer in relation to the, to, to the ends that they can serve. If, if someone is in, is in the uh, desert and has not had access to water for three days and comes across uh, another person that has a, a jug of water uh, and has in his pocket, let's say he even has that, that Graf pink diamond that, was worth, that sold for $46 million, would he exchange the diamond for the water? Yes. Because the water achieves a much higher end. That is, staying alive for another three days. You can go about three days without water, okay? Three or four days, whatever it is. And so he, he would trade the diamond for the water. But water is so abundant vis-a-vis -vis diamonds in, our, in any normal situation that we're aware of that water is, ha, has a much lower value. And that, that, that is the solution to the paradox of value. That is, the classical school went wrong because it focused on all the water in the world. It, it talked about water versus diamonds. Menger focused on the marginal units, the units that the individual was, choos which was choosing between. Okay. Was he choosing a, a diamond in a situation where there, there was a lot of water or, or, or uh, uh, between a diamond and water in, you know, in a situation uh, in a lifeboat situation or in a desert situation. So the Austrians always focus on concrete units because those are the units, those actual goods that we're dealing with at the moment that are the objects of choice and therefore of human valuation. We're valuing them in relation to our welfare. Now Menger went on and developed something called a theory of imputation. Um, and this comes from his very I idea of how value and production are interrelated. You remember those trinities of value, okay? The value starts with, with, with the end or the want, okay? And then is imputed to the good. So if, if you look here, let's say bread has a value, okay? Now notice the upward arrow, okay? Bread is valuable because it satisfies a human want. Bread at the wholesale level is valuable because it's integral in the production. It causes the production of, of bread at the retail level when you combine it with transportation and labor. Okay. Flour is only valuable, not valuable directly to consumers. Consumers don't, don't, don't want flour. Let's assume they, they don't bake their own bread. Consumers don't want flour. They want the, the out output that flour delivers to them eventually. The point is, though, flour helps cause the production of wholesale bread, which in turn helps cause the production of retail bread. Finally, wheat is valuable because it's integral in the production of flour. So notice, production comes from the top down. It comes from the inputs down. The classical school made the mistake of thinking that value and production both came from the top down. That, that flour was valuable because it costs a lot to buy the, or because it costs something to buy the wheat. And that bread was valuable because it was a cost of production of baking the bread, 
by hiring laborers and hiring uh, and, and, and buying or renting ovens and so on. Okay? But Menger said, no, 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 they go in different directions. Okay? So the ends cause the value to begin with, and the value is imputed upwards or backwards to the factors of production all the way up to land and labor. Whereas on the other hand, that's what causes the production. The fact that this prospective value in the output causes people to undertake the efforts at the higher stages of production to, to, to produce the good. So um, you can think of it in terms of, 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 of let's say, diamonds. Um, I used to give my, my undergraduates the following example. Um, back in the old days, uh, if you recall the movie Witness with Harrison Ford, um, takes place in the Amish country, and, and the Amish are known as the simple people. And the simple people, they don't even have buttons on their um, clothing. There's just like sort of hooks and hoops uh, that they fasten their clothing with because they, they're against any kind of ostentation. Okay? So if all Americans or everyone adopted the values of the Amish, what would be the value of diamonds? Would diamonds have a value? Diamonds wouldn't have a value because they wouldn't, they wouldn't play any part in, in bringing about or improving human well-being because no one would see them as, as, as satisfying a want. The wants of those things would disappear okay, if they adopted those values. But which also means, by the way, that because diamonds don't have a value, the things that cause the production of diamonds do not have a value. So suddenly, the high salaries paid to, um, to, to, to jewelers and, and, uh, and um, those who can identify high quality gems and so on, the values of those skills would, would, would plummet to zero. And of course, the value of diamond mines, assuming there's no industrial uses for diamonds, would fall to zero. So a diamond isn't expensive because Diamond mines are very costly, and also it's very costly to, 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 to mine diamonds. It's rather, the other, it's rather the other way around, right? Right? I mean, so, it's, so, so a diamond mine is valuable only because people place such a high value on diamonds, and because of the scarcity of diamonds in relation to human wants for them. So prices cause, prices, prices determine costs, not the other way around. And Menger used the idea of uh, people um, not, not smoking anymore. And he went through it in, very, in detail and showed um, uh, that, that the, this dislike for tobacco or this abandonment of the, the habit of, of, of consuming tobacco in any way would bring about um, a zero price for rolling machines, a zero price for tobacco, and a zero price for tobacco land if it couldn't be used for any other good or any other uh, type of production. So that's Menger's law of imputation. Um, he actually took it a little further. Um, all it tells us here is that the total amount of money spent on bread, and we're forgetting about interest, would be equal in value um, to, the, to the bread at wholesale, and the, the total amount that you would spend on wholesale would, would be equal in value to, 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 to the flour, okay, and so on. So in other words, you would you take the value of, of, of all of the things in that stage producing that good, and that would attach itself to the higher stage, okay? So the value would be um, atta uh, attached for, for the, all what Menger called the complementary goods, okay? All the goods in, 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 this, in, in wheat would be equal in value to all the goods in, in, in flour, forgetting about the interest differential and any profit there, okay? But Menger wanted to go further. He said, wait a minute, he says, that doesn't explain how each individual unit, remember the unit of the goods is, is, is what is important, each individual unit of a factor of production is, is, is valued and priced. Okay. We have to go a little bit further. And here again, he asked a very important question, okay, a very insightful question that unraveled the puzzle. Um, let me just give you this example. Let's say you could produce 1,000 bushels of wheat. Okay, this is called a production function. Uh, w is wheat, L is labor, H is horses, P is plow, A is acre, acres of land, F is pounds of fertilizer. Okay, so this is a production function. That is a technological recipe for producing wheat. Um, if you had 90, uh, 90 hours of labor and uh, 90 days of labor and you had two horses and you had one plow and 40 acres and uh, 500 pounds of fertilizer, excuse me, then you could actually produce uh, 1,000 bushels of wheat. So Menger asked the question, 
What is the value of 100 sacks, 100 pounds of fertilizer? Let's say they come in 100 pound sacks. Of all of those things, all of those things cooperate in producing 1,000 bushels of wheat. How could we attach a value to one, one unit of all of those different things? Well, Menger simply asked the question, how much would the total product decrease, how much would that 1,000 bushels of wheat decrease if a unit of the factory production was subtracted from the process of production? If we took 100 pounds of fertilizer away from all of those other things, what would be the, the, the amount of, of wheat produced? And this is the theory of, of fact, factor pricing. He never followed it completely through to money prices, but um, here's his solution. So let's assume we change delta F, we change the fertilizer, we reduce it by 100 pounds. That will cause a change in wheat, let's say, by 40 bushels. So now you only produce 960 bushels, OK? So we call that the marginal product of 100 pounds of fertilizer, OK? It's 40 um, bushels of wheat. Therefore, the value of, of the marginal product, the value of the 100 pounds of wheat, is simply the marginal utility that the farmer attaches to the 40 bushels of wheat that would not be produced if you didn't have that extra 100 pounds of fertilizer, okay? Now, he didn't go as far as to go into money, but I will do that um, very quickly. Um, the monetary value of 100, uh, of 100 pounds of fertilizer to the farmer in a money economy is called this marginal revenue product. You don't have to worry about that. We we'll talked about it later. Uh, the additional revenue earned by using an additional sack of fertilizer with a 100-pound sack. So we assume that the price of a bushel of wheat is, is $2, okay? Well, then, the, the value of that sack is $2 times the extra 40 bushels of wheat that you could get and sell on the market for $2 a piece, which is $80. He'd be willing to pay up to $80 for, for that bushel of wheat. So Menger, uh, I'm sorry, up to $80 for, for that uh, sack of 100 pounds of fertilizer. So Menger sol completely solved this. Okay. Now, this marginal productivity theory took many years to be developed, uh, and the Austrians were instrumental in developing it, but Menger had the seeds of, 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 of the, the theory. Okay? He had this, this brilliant insight. And again, it was this, this idea of asking the appropriate question that led to the solution. Okay, lastly, um, Menger thought that the um, classical economists were all wet in saying that the value of a good um, is equal in value to the price of the good, because in the long run, cost of production equals price. Menger says, that's, that's ridiculous. And he gave a simple example of exchange. He says, if, 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 if uh, the, by the way, the, the item or the animal that's in um, parentheses is, is the uh, one that the individual does not have, okay? So A ranks a horse, just look at A, ranks a horse above a cow, but he doesn't have a horse. What does that mean? That means if he met someone who was willing to give him a horse for a cow, he would make the exchange. On the other hand, there's a B out there who um, doesn't have a cow but has a horse, but would prefer a cow to a horse. Okay? It has a higher margin utility to him. So what Menger shows is that if they met, if they knew of each other's existence, they would make the exchange. And he goes beyond that and he says, look, this is mutually beneficial. Okay? Each individual gives up something that he or she values less for something that they value more. They receive in return something they value more than what they give up. And that's the essence of exchange. That's the essence of the whole economy, because the, the whole economy, the whole market economy, is simply a network of voluntary exchanges. Whether it be someone buying an iPad or someone making, um, hiring an illegal worker, okay? Doesn't matter. Menger's theory covers all instances. There is only one theory of price, and as we'll see, of exchange. He, he doesn't go much further than that, but you can see in today, uh, more. More modern example, obviously, um, whenever you buy anything, let's say someone buys a BMW, okay, the buyer prefers the BMW to the, to the $50,000 that he gives up. 
Okay? Whereas the seller prefers the $50,000 that is received to what, what he, the product that he's giving up. Now, that's not to say that there can't be buyer's regret. Okay? Later on, the buyer might say, you know what, this BMW is, 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 is a crappy car. I don't like it. Okay? Would have rather gotten um, you know, uh, uh, an Acura or a Lexus or whatever. Okay. But at the, we're not worried about that as economists. At the point of exchange, okay, right before the exchange, we call ex ante from, from the standpoint of before the exchange, um, they both have these valuations. They're called reverse valuations. So not only aren't the goods equal, they're not equal to either buyer. There's a double, uh, to either participant in the exchange, there's a double inequality of value. The seller values the $50,000 more than BMW, the buyer values the BMW more than the $50,000, okay? There's no equality anywhere to be found there. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. We have, I think, about five minutes for questions by that clock. Any questions? In the back. Stand up. I'll talk to you individually about that, okay? I think that would be better. Um, any, any general question or comment? Okay, thank you very much.